some kind of a model for faith that I can understand and comprehend, and there's got to be something for belief that I can understand. I've got to be able to model it in my life, and I've got to be able to understand that I'm making progress in the very area that I need to make progress, which is divine healing. And uh, I couldn't find, you know, Andrew Womack absolutely believed in divine healing, but, but he stopped at faith. Just believe. Don't doubt. And I'm like, okay, clearly I am doubting because I'm not well. Right? So you're going to default back to unworthy, unwelcome, and unnecessary if you don't have a practical ability to apply the gospel of Jesus Christ in your life and measure it. And in order to do that, you actually have to go to the foundation of it and understand how does it, how does it actually function and how does it actually work. And so this quest started you know, back in 2010, I suppose. And for five years, I, I kept the can on the streets of Cleveland ministering to homeless um, Nobody wanted to minister to him. Uh, nobody would let me minister in a church. Nobody trusted me as any kind of a teacher. Uh, but I knew that I knew more about God than most of the people I had ever met. And the results that I was getting on the streets were incredibly powerful. Because I would go home and say, okay, if I'm to lay hands on somebody in the name of Jesus and it doesn't work, it isn't your word, what happened? And I would go home and say, what happened? Yeah. Just like I was an apprentice to any other job I'd ever had. How does this work? Why do you do it this way? What's this wrench for? What's that wrench for? How does it work? How does it, how does it work? And, and so I wanted to know all the principles of why the thing, why ministry should work, shouldn't work, and, and the do's and the don'ts. And I just kept asking questions and asking questions and asking questions. Well, if you're going to ask the question, then you're going to have to pray. You're going to have to find patterns of prayer that work for you, and that's a whole other message at another day. But in the end... Five years after doing that, um, all of a sudden, he sends me to Karis, and I thought, why now? But, I mean, really cool. I was so excited to come to Karis. I, I felt like uh, it was an honor. I felt like the fact that he would set aside this time for me, I just felt like I was the most special person in the whole world. I thought, you would do this for me? For me, you would do such a, an amazing thing like this? And uh, so but when I came to Karis, the whole focus of Karis was nothing more than to uh, immerse myself in God, and, and, and I understood the practical natures of ministry, but I wanted what Karis offered from the, from the pulpit. I knew that I wanted it, and I knew that it was good. I knew that it was more than good. I knew that it was probably the best concentration of, of the truth that you could find anywhere in the world with the least amount of infiltration of religion. Because religion is what Satan raises up to destroy you and it's works related and it has crept into ministry it has crept into the sinners it's crept into every little aspect of religion it's crept into the church the reason our country is going off a cliff is because the spirit of religion is alive and flourishing not just in denominations but in every spirit filled born again church there is it's, it runs the show here and so we come at the spirit of religion we attack that sucker, and we. It, but it, it, this ministry has a tendency to cause offense, and I, I promise you, I will go overboard not to cause offense because I'll teach at some point through the parable of the sower that that is the last thing that you want to do. And as a preacher, you're not given a leash to cause offense. You're not. People can take offense, but you're, but you're to preach in such a fashion th that it actually doesn't evoke offense. It convicts right. while drawing people to the light, not convict into judging the light. Mm -hmm. yes. And there's a pattern of preaching that actually does do one and does do the other. And, uh, but if you've got that religion thing in you, and if, if I come against the sinner's prayer, which I promise you I will, but I'll show it to you biblically why it's not a, a pattern of salvation. Um, if you've led 50 people to salvation, you might be a little bit upset if one of them was your dad. You know what I'm saying? And you'd be like, wait a minute, my whole ministry's been a failure. Well, I do believe the Holy Spirit can work through any meeting of ministry, right? He puts you out there to minister, so don't use it to critique your ministry of the past. You learn from what you've done and what others have done wrong and take it into the future and do it better. You know, Paul commands us, he commands us to, to run a race to win the race, not to come in second or third. It's, it's a disciple of Jesus Christ strives for excellence. It doesn't settle for second best. It never settles. You cannot settle as a disciple. 
there's a notion that's prevailing in Christianity that that if I become a disciple of Jesus Christ, that I'm just going to prosper and it's going to be a bed of roses. That is such a flat-out joke and a lie. Jesus Christ was persecuted everywhere that he went. Jesus Christ, the hope of glory, that's who's in you. That's whose life is in you. You don't have your life anymore. You gave your life up. You gave up your life. The only life that's in you is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's what comes through you. And when that comes through you, it causes the world to react and oppress it. So you're going to go from storm to storm to storm to storm to storm, just like Jesus went from storm to storm to storm to storm to storm to storm. It doesn't mean you won't have plenty of money going through them, but you'll be going through storms. We've, we spent the last few weeks teaching that the fact that the biblical ordained pattern of creating the identity within you is storms. It's actually sufferings, and it's 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 it's. Oh. Okay, we're not even going to go there. But 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 when you start to realize, wow, this is what's really happening, all of a sudden it'll, it'll start to bring into context. Well, wait a minute, then then I just need to know how to navigate the thing I'm in. Because the blessing of God is actually big enough to overcome whatever the world throws at it. But it may not look like it's big enough to overcome until the moment that it does. Up until that moment, it could look like a freight train coming at you at a 1,000 mile an hour, and it's bigger than you, and it's going to run you over, but it can't touch you. But that doesn't mean that it can't come in within the smallest fraction of a dimension of space before your nose. And it's going to come, and it's going to come with a big bluff. And if it was if it was able to, to shake Elijah after the greatest revival of the Old Testament on Mount Carmel and flip him out and have him submit to the spirit of fear and run for his life for 80 days, you better believe that it can do the same thing to us. We've got to understand that, that the power of darkness is real and, and that, that it comes with a great force. And if you're going to rise up at Karis to oppress it, to push back on the kingdom of darkness, oh, it's going to push back on you. Because it's going to say, well, we'll just find out just how much you really do believe the things that you're starting to say. Because if you do believe them, and you do get the revelation down deep, you have authority and power over darkness. One person can wreck his kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, worldwide. It doesn't take an army. One man in front of a few people can do great damage to him. The reality is that the enemy respects you more than you probably respect yourself. He understands the threat because he's been taken out by man and woman alike over history. And he knows the sound. He knows what they sound like. He knows how they walk. He knows how they act. So he looks at you and he says, I can't let this thing or this thing out. Because if this thing gains any more revelation, then then this thing will take me out. And it hates you, evil hates you, more than you can ever imagine. So I ended up coming to Karis just thinking I was going to take a giant chill pill and really enjoy my three years of Karis there. And the one thing I noticed was that there was a lot of students that came from all over the world. I was blown away by people that came from everywhere who had sold everything. And, 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 and at, least half of, at least half of our class, Jerry's class and my class in 2016, they came with a physical ailment or they came with some kind of a mental oppression that was causing them or they came from this, no matter what they did, they failed mentality, they failed at their job, they failed at their marriage, they failed in finances, there was, or there was an addiction issue. That was, there was something chronic that wasn't solved where they were. And they came to Karis to get it solved. And I knew that after a couple of months, that if they hadn't received the answer to that prayer, that the distractions of trying to find a house, trying to find a job, trying to breathe, trying to keep your skin <laughs> hydrated, and, and adjust to this crazy place called the mountains of Colorado, and the whirlwind that goes on around you, because you left in faith, that, that people were going to turn and they were going to look away from the cross, and they weren't going to get the benefit of the teaching that God sent them. And I could see the people, and I thought to God, I thought, well, this is a, this is a big problem. Because Karis, it does not bill itself as a ministry. They're a teaching institution. They're a college, and they're an, ex, they're an expert college. They say, we're not a church. We're a college. We teach you. Mm-hmm. You need to have a pastor. You need to be plugged into an organization that equips you. 
This is what we do extremely well, and they're not shy of telling you what they do, and they're not shy of saying this is what we don't do well, and we're not trying to do it better necessarily. Although the way they minister to students compared to the way Jerry and I were is light years how much more energy they put into that. But the reality is there's something that they do exceptionally well, and you're here for that. But there's another place that you really need to plug in if you want to harness that. And so I told the Lord, I said, well, this is an injustice, and, and I can't believe that you'd call all these people here and you'd not have a solution for it. And he said, well, you're going to be the one to minister to them. And I was like, oh, no, I'm not. That ain't happening. That's not happening. I promise you that's not going to happen. Listen, those people at the front of the pulpit, when they went, I went out the first year, they were like, you're a plebe. You know nothing. You, I'm the minister up here. You listen to me. You don't teach, right? We weren't even allowed to teach until, until we took a class in second year. And so I was like, God, we can't do that. That's, that's like, you're going to get me kicked out of Bible college. I can't, I want to stay here, you know? So, so he said, now you're going to start the Desperados. And he gave us a creed. And that's another testimony. And, and Jerry will testify. I just started doing what I did at Cleveland at, at home. And I wasn't pushed or anything. I just, I could over here and I could tell someone what was in a straight. And I'd say, hey, listen, if you, you know, I'd talk for a few minutes and they go, wait, wait a minute, you understand what I'm doing? I said, yeah, here, I got this practical thing. If you try this, you're going to start to see immediate results. And they'd be like, oh my God, that, that worked. And I'm like, that's cool, man. If you need help, just, uh, as long as you, this is the reality for everybody in here. And I've said this before, you, you come as long as you feel like you're led to come and you have a need and I'll help you solve it. When you decide that you've had enough and you move on, no harm, no foul. Listen, it's a free country. It's a free world. And I'm not the only guy in town by a long shot. And so, um, but we found after first year, I don't know how many students. We were teaching first year. We were taking students on the streets first year. We taught all summer long students. And then second year, someone said, you've got to have a Bible study at my house. And we invented Taco Tuesday. And then third year, we taught every single day up at Karis, every single morning from 7 to 8. Students came in early to hear this stuff that you're coming here at 6 o'clock to hear. Only, I'd have to say, it's maybe more refined. There's more depth to it. And, and since then, there's been a whole range of ministry experience. Amen. He shoved us into prisons. We ignited a revival in the only prison that we've been in. We pulled people out of that prison. We took them onto the streets. We've changed their lives on the streets. We've got them reacclimated to society. Um, we went, did that the very same thing in the halfway home ministry. But it's all because I understand how to minister. I know how to minister. And I understand that this comes out of one identity. And, and, and that's really what I teach. I teach, you can call it the making of a ministry. You can call it the foundations of ministry. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can call it something. But the reality is it's going to be teaching you how to minister. You as a Christian are a minister. First, that's your identity as a minister. Christ was a minister. That's who you are. You've been commanded to do his work. Well, wait a minute. Then I need to know what his work was. I sure as heck need to know how to do it. And I need to know how to do it well because I'm supposed to do it with excellence. Um, and so to really understand how to minister makes you the pastor. You know, the, the pastor, as a, as a guy who can stand up and preach... Preaching is, is, is a discipline that is incredibly in short supply to preach, to preach the gospel. But to minister to your congregation as a true shepherd and then to teach them how to minister as all together, that's the first century church. That's how that rolled. And this weekend, I was in, I, I took a vac, my wife and I took a vacation and we blew over to uh, Moab, Utah, and we just goofed off for a week or thereabouts, not quite a week, over a long weekend. And so the church was handled by the people. Um, a kid that I've been teaching and working with for whew, two years now uh, preached. I've been teaching him how to preach. Uh, from what I understand, he preached like a rock star. Real good anointing message. Um, but what was really cool about it was somebody didn't feel good, Rachel, so she didn't go to church because she felt so ill. and She was looking after our place out in Fair, uh, Florissant, and the whole church just reports to her house and ministers to her, and she's healed on the spot. And that's what you do. You, you, you learn how to minister, and when this identity comes out of you, then you just go minister. Because you know that I can go do that. God says, yeah, you go do that, because you're the one that's going to be able to understand what to do, how to do it, and it's going to be successful. We didn't shut our church down over COVID. I got fired over that. We went door-to-door -door on COVID. We crushed COVID in the bed. Crushed it, crushed it, crushed it, crushed it. We pulled people that were incredibly ill with symptoms 
brought them into the church, made them sit through a service, then we prayed over them, then they got healed. We exposed the entire congregation to COVID. We exposed this town to COVID. If you believe the, if you believe the reports, but nobody got sick. Only people got well because Jesus called disease out into the street. And it didn't, it wasn't contingent on anybody else's faith. Understanding how to minister, number one, then also understanding that we had a plague, that's what everybody called it, and they put a name to it, so okay, it's a plague, it's a worldwide pandemic, don't believe it, but that's okay. Now we've, you've set the limits to what this thing is, so let's see how Jesus would minister to this. He would call everybody out into the marketplace, sick, nobody had faith because nobody's born again. Everybody got well that sought healing and nobody got sick or that didn't have it. So you don't run from a thing like COVID. You expose it as a fraud. And, and, and you bring all the people together and you show that it doesn't spread because in the name of Jesus Christ, it has no authority to spread. And, and then it has no authority to stay. And you get miraculous healings and you get the witness built up. And then you destroy that spirit of fear that's behind that whole sickness and, and that whole intense illness that it was bringing on people. You destroy that spirit. And that's how you, how you attack it. That's also how you get fired. Um, <laughs> it's also how you get fired because my board, my, board, my board was made up of pastors and they all closed their church. <laughs> and lo and behold, we never closed our church. And they had about three months of me preaching that from the pulpit and they couldn't handle it anymore. And <laughs> That's another testimony. But we do have church on Sundays now and it's a home church. And it floats around. Now it's in the springs, and it's in the springs probably. Looks like it might be in the springs through September. Um, but it, but it's going to it's going to end up in Guffey at some point. We've got a ministry in Guffey going on. So now that's not the home church that they talked about at Harris the other day. Is it that they go to different places, and then every now and then they get together in a big group? Or is it? No, nah, I don't think so. Okay. This is present. It's called Presence Worship Center. Trey Hepson uh, and I went to school together with. Um, Jerry, super anointed praise and worship leader. He takes care of all the praise of worship for the Desperados. Yeah. Um, and so we we uh, so we bounced out of a church church into a home church, yeah. which was turned out to be just as fine with me actually. And there's a little bit more freedom involved in home churches than having a board of directors overseeing you and deciding you know get, taking offense to what you preach because any event. So. That just took me through Karis, and it nat- it's just the natural evolution. We're still doing what we're doing, yeah. and we're still uh, very much tied to Karis, very much working with Karis students. But we but we work in the community, and, and I'll, I'll I'll bring two witnesses, and then I'll start this teaching, and I'll give you guys 40 minutes of of solid um, practical application here, and give you a direction as to where we're headed. The problem with the church is that it's stuck inside of itself. Then when it gets outside of itself, it actually produces a pretty crummy witness. Um, we, we look at evangelism completely different than the past. You've got to understand that we're in the 21st century. It's a different times. Communication is different. Everything is different. So you've got to look at evangel. I'm an evangelist first, pastor second. I know that I'm called into evangelism. That's That was always the call. Operate with the pastor's heart. You got a flock of people, take care of people, then you have more people. Um, Jesus was a pastor, but Jesus was an evangelist as well, very much evangelical. So we're always reaching out into the community and looking for different ways to spread the gospel. So we'll use businesses as hubs. We'll approach business leaders. We'll go into certain communities and approach somebody who's a Christian there and say, Hey, would you like to would you like to change the dynamics of your community? And and Guffy is a little mountain town that's about an hour the, that away thereabouts, and uh, it's small. It's really small. That's what it has to its advantage. If you can't change Guffy, you can't change Colorado Springs. But it has its own school. It has its own library. It has its own fire department. It has its own paramedics. It has its own bar and restaurant. So it has a central place for people to gather. It has a place for their kids to get educated. It has people that work, that live and work there that take care of them that obviously are service-minded, firemen and, and paramedics. Um, and so you go into Guffey. Can you infiltrate the school system? Can you infiltrate the bar? Can you infiltrate the fire department? Can you take the town of Guffey over? Can you take Guffey and flip it from being carnal to spiritual? Yeah, the heck, of course you can. Right? Do you want to spend the time to flip it? 
Well, yes. If God says go to Guffey, you go to Guffey. So, so we've been in Guffey now since October 31st of last year. We held a. He said, "Go hold a revival meeting outside on on October 31st." Up mountain weather can be a little sketchy at that time of year, but it was a mind blowing opening yeah. of an event. Oh my God, the power of God was so huge. And ever since then, we have been expanding in that community. We've taken over that bar. We own the bar. We own the restaurant. <laughs> And uh, the Desperados, they, they, they make coffee for our church. They, 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 they're they just awesome. And you brought the owner. The owner, yeah. Right, right, right. Um, I mean, and, and that's, that's uh, but, you know, we, we got a volunteer inside the school system. And then we asked to preach the gospel in the school, and they said, absolutely not. And so we went back and said, how about we preach the gospel in the school? That's not going to happen. We've got rules here. And so we kept pushing this curriculum across so that we could have a class that we could, no, no, you need to have a class for your K through two second graders that's Bible based that we teach. So they know who Jesus is. They know who God is and they can experience the power of God. And you need to have one for it because it goes up to sixth grade, third through sixth. Mm -hmm. And this is the class we want to teach. And they said, no, 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 no. Then the principal of that school, then we started showing up at school board meetings. So we're going to run for the school board, and we will beat you. And, but friendly, right? They're like, you really want to be part of the school board? Yeah, this is what we're, we're serious about this. And so then the principal falls down with an illness, and, and it's a personal issue coupled to a physical thing. And where does she come to? The only people that have been preaching the gospel to her for the year. And she says, you're the only person I can talk to about this. It's about Jesus. And in the end, I want you to have your class. You can have it this wow. year. So we got a class in Guffey, in a, in a public school system, teaching Jesus with our own curriculum. But it happened through ministry. It was ministry. It was ministry. Ministering to the owners of the bar, then all of a sudden produces favor with the owners of the bar. And faith also. Um, Action, faith. So, in any event... Um, we also, we also, so when you go into a business and you take care of a business person, they may have 50, 60 employees now that you have an opportunity to expand. And if you think about revival, revival, by design, God does something in a place and he draws people to it. They have an experience and they go out with that fire and they carry that fire everywhere they go. That's right. And so you go into a business, get, a, get the owners on fire in a business, get them to trust you. Get them, first of all, bring them into unity under authority so that you've established authority in that restaurant so you've pushed the forces of darkness out so you've got the freedom to do the gospel and produce the gospel. Then what happens is the people that are in there working who wouldn't normally receive a minister in any way see a minister eating with the owner over and over and over and people coming into that restaurant for healing and ministry and so forth. And then when all of a sudden something happens, they come to you and they say, I don't know. But I trust you that you're just not one of them crazy Christians. And I'm like, actually, I am a crazy Christian. <laughs> but this is what a crazy Christian looks like. Those other people are actually fraudulent. They're not really Christian. They're not acting and behaving Christian. And then all of a sudden, you find you watch this restaurant explode into Christianity. And people give their lives to Christ. They get baptized in the Holy Spirit. And everything changes. And, and, this, and the second thing I'll, I'll tell you before we lead is that this young boy's name is Chase. His mother's name is Claire. When was the first time we were there? Was it like six months ago? I've been in this restaurant for two years, and, and there's been a ton of miracles. Claire is a waitress who's witnessed a lot, wanted to talk about Jesus, but then get super cold feet and walk away. Can't handle it. But then all of a sudden, through an impartation, I said, can I do an impartation? We'll teach on impartations here. I did an impartation so that she could experience God, and she came back, and she's like, Oh, my God, this is amazing. And I said, okay. And she set an appointment with, with uh, Young and I, and we came, and we ministered to her and, and her, her living boyfriend. Didn't tell them they were living in sin either. Okay? Right? Right. Didn't draw attention to their sin. Drew attention to mercy. Drew attention to love. Drew attention to the, all the things that Jesus represented. And they both gave their lives to Christ with tears. They both got baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. Huge, powerful deliverance. For the first time, talked to Chase, talked to him, and did an impart got permission to do an impartation. Well, all of a sudden now, we go six months later, and the, the miracles in this household, are they just keep manifesting and keep growing. 
family got reunited, her, her and her father got reunited, and, um, but it turns out Jace is, he's going into third grade, but he can't, he can't pass first grade reading. He's at a fifth grade science level and a fifth grade math level. He's a genius. He's a super smart kid. Mm-hmm. That you can just tell by the questions that we ask him. He asked me a question about God, and the questions he asked are like, wow, that is really a deep question. You know, you can just tell the kid's got these different wheels that turn a little different way. And so uh, his mother told me and said, hey, we got we got problems here, and um, and I don't know what to do about it. The school system's going to do a bunch of other stuff. They call it dyslexia, and but it's really causing a big problem. And so I said, "Wow, well, oh, this is nothing. Listen, we'll lay hands on the kid, and he'll get he'll get he'll be reading at a third grade level immediately." And she just thought that was like the craziest thing ever. And I said, "No, this is demonic. This isn't normal. This isn't natural. I don't care what name you have on it. He's a child of God, and uh, and we've created authority in this household now. We've established authority. You'll hear a lot about authority in this in these meetings because you have to understand." How, Yes, the authority of Christ is in you, but that doesn't mean that you're functioning in that authority. Right. Whom you serve, that's whose servant you are. That's Romans six. That's Romans six sixteen. You can be a born again, spirit filled, baptized in the Holy Spirit Christian, everything going for you, and operate of the authority of Adam, which is at zero. These two things can walk har- harmoniously together. Uh, it's why a lot of Christians aren't prospering. Because they don't recognize the fact that, that there, there's a set of spiritual laws that they have to understand how they function so that they can not only know what the new man is, but how do I actually operate in it and how can I discern when I'm not? Because there's no, the only penalty to not functioning in the new man is to you. It doesn't change God's relationship with you. He loves you. Yeah. Repentance is this humongous gift of love. If you would just recognize that it's wrong, you get this total free pass like, whoa. All right, I repent of that. I don't want anything to do with that. God, you come in here and fix me, and boom, I'm going to come over here if it's all the same to you. And you can just jump right back in, the, in this identity as fast as you can. Satan's going to keep trying to bait you into this identity, and that's all Satan does. Mm-hmm. All he's trying to do is move you into one identity, and God's trying to move you into another. Mm-hmm. Satan's trying to move you this way. The Holy Spirit is designed to move you this way. And if you can start to recognize what this is, what this is, and how it functions, how it operates, and how to monitor it, then all of a sudden, one day, you'll go, oh, my goodness. I can control the flow of the blessing. Yeah. It's not a mystery to me. The blessing is flowing mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because I am this person. And things change. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because your expectation that you place on that rises because you understand how it works and how it functions. Hallelujah. And you know that you know that you know. Plus, you get filled with cares telling you that you are this, and a bag of tricks, that you are this amazing individual in the eyes of God. And he loves you, and, and you can set aside the guilt and the shame and the condemnation and all that Amen. stuff. Amen. Um, and so we went down there. Who Was it who, Was it you and I? You and I went down there. Mm-hmm. So we give him a checkup from the neck up, you know, a little tune-up, family tune-up. Um, you know, so make sure authority's there, get a witness, talk back and forth, and bring, bring Jace out early and say, listen, I said, I'm going to ask to pray for you later, kid. He's like seven or eight or nine, however, however it is in third grade. And I said, um, so you're, 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 you're getting him smoothed into the fact that you're going to be talking to him later. And then when you bring him out, he's not all freaked out. And then I got permission to lay hands on him. I got permission from the parents. We got authority everywhere. Not that you need authority from the kids. You don't need authority from him. But it sure is wonderful if you have it. Right? God is going to honor the kids' petition. Do you want to read? Yes. you want to read like better than anybody else? Yeah. Like, like the way God made you. He made you smart in math. He made you smart in reading. It clearly, you have to be or, or smart in math and smart in science. Clearly, he made you smart in reading. Right. So I'm just going to apply what God gave you. And he goes to school. Of course, his testimony comes with he's with a week of school, starting school, and his new teacher pulled his. To, the first impartation we did on Chase. This is actually cool. The teacher called his parents in and said, "We have to have a conference. <laughs> what did you do to Chase? <laughs> because the kid so radically changed his behavior and, and, and the way he treated people and the way he treated the teacher. They thought that he went to some specialist somewhere. Wow. They were floored." By the upgraded chase. And so now we're a couple months later. And so this notion that I'm going to lay hands on her child. And something's going to happen. It's not so foreign to her. Because she's got a witness from one teacher already. Now the new teacher comes in. 
and calls her up and says, listen, we've got all the reports on him. I know we've got all the special extra work we've got to do because he's dyslexic, blah, 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 blah. But I'm telling you, the kid reads like a rock star. <laughs> he reads as well as anybody in this class. He's not deficient. I can't find no deficiency in the kid's reading. Yeah. So that comes from an understanding of how to minister and recognizing that we need to spread this out into the community. We need to demonstrate it in the community. And once you know how to do it, God will give you all kinds of great opportunities to touch people who know that Jesus is Lord. The reality is you live in a Christian nation. 80% of the people in this country know that, in fact, maybe we'll do this, but typically we'll go down to the Colorado Springs for two or three sessions, and we'll ask every single person we come across two questions. When's the first time you heard the name of Jesus? Everybody stops in their tracks, and they go, oh. Long time ago, everybody's heard of the name of Jesus. We've not found one person who doesn't know about Jesus. Then the next question is, oh, well, then when was the first time you gave, not the second time, not the third time, not the fourth time, because they said the sinner's prayer ten times. When was the first time you gave your life to Jesus? Jesus. And you're going to find that probably 90% of the people have a, have a first-time encounter with Christ. So you're ministering to people that are already saved. But they're stuck, and they're broke as a joke, and they don't get it. And they're deep in sin because they don't have any power out of it because no one's taken the time to, to talk to them about the Holy Spirit. No one's ministered to them in love, brought this trust into them where they're like, wait a minute, you're telling me the truth. This is something I can sink my teeth into. You're the first person who sat down and explained it to me. And then they reach out and they take the very thing that they need from God. And then all of a sudden they're off to the races. So, all right. Let's just start. <laughs> that gives you a little bit of an idea this thing's been around for a while it's going to change yeah. it has a church so if the church is your thing it's got that it's got outside work if that's your deal and it's got a Wednesday thing if that's your thing and it's got a Tuesday thing in Guffy if that's your thing and it's got all kinds of other things if those are your things <laughs> it's got a lot of things and it, we do Native American ministry too we're going on a mission trip in a week and then we'll, we'll be on we're we have a ton of Native American ministry. Yeah, we do. Where are y'all going in a week? We're going up to the we're going back to the Navajo Nation the third week in September. There's a revival meeting going on, and they have me preaching um, Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday afternoon. And then the the, the guy who, Tyler who preached for me Sunday, my protege, is preaching after me on on Saturday night to end the whole thing. But um, it's our third trip to that nation. Tons and tons and tons of miracles. Tons of baptism. It's a dirt floor church. It's really, really cool. Uh, we also have a presence on the Crow Reservation. Two totally different types of Indian reservations. Uh, Navajo, dirt poor, um, low, low percentage of Christians. Very much in the tra tradition. The Crow Nation has the highest percentage of Christians in, of, of all of the uh, Native American nations. So you've got two extremes, almost mm -hmm. two extremes. And the, the most prominent family on the Crow Reservation, the Real Bird family, two years ago we went up to the Crow Reservation on a call from God to go. We went out of obedience. Rachel was there. Jerry was there. And the, uh, the head of the most prominent family, both politically and in power and in size, there's like a thousand of these people on this reservation, the Real Bird family, the head of that clan, Chuck Real Bird, had a broken hip, and he was in the hospital, and they were going to do a surgery the next day on it. It was the only way to repair it. And we went into the hospital and laid hands on him, and the hip was instantly healed, and he didn't have to have surgery the next day. But what was cool was he felt God's power. Mm -hmm. And he got a revelation that Jesus was Lord and that this guy that God sent had an anointing on him of great power, and he spread that witness out to all of his family. That there's this ministry, and I think they're a biker gang, is what he thought, because we're the Desperados. And, uh, and, but there's this man, and he's got this power, and it's from the Creator, and it's given from the Creator, and it's for our, it's for our reservation. Well, we get called back this past June to go, and he's dead. He died six months ago. Uh, and we figured the witness died with him, and um, we didn't have any way of getting back to the real birds. I'm not really good at keeping connections sometimes. Uh, you know, we keep these great witnesses. There is a, a thing about stewarding witnesses. We could probably do much better because we create so many of them. But 
God stewarded it for us That's right. That's because That's we, right. we show up, we don't know how to reach the people, and he says, go to this site. We didn't know where it was, so we had, we had one of the guys that came out of our prison ministry, Antonio, all right, prophet, you find this way. You, what is it? Just go. We're going to go forward, straight, left, right, until we find the property we're supposed to pray over. And, and Antonio was like, what? Yeah, you're the prophet, do it. And, but he gets us there. Yeah. He gets us there. And, and we pull into this property, which we don't have any, any, uh, any clue really what to do but to pray. But, of course, the real birds see us on their real bird property. And they come up and say, uh, excuse me. <laughs> I say, well, listen, we're not here for anything other than to pray for the real bird family. You're here to pray for the real bird family? Yeah, God called us from Colorado to pray for the family. Well, that's who I am. That's my, That's my grandfather you're talking about. And so next thing you know, we report to like prime time position A yeah. right on the river in the shade. And we spent the next three or four days, no, an extra day, five days, yeah, five, five, just five. ministering house to house and tent to tent. And it was, it was pretty cool. And then they called us up and said, listen, their main, their main event is, in, is, is called Crow Fair, which is where we healed Chuck Realbird or God Realbird a couple of years ago. Um, that's 23 Native American tribes come as one. So if you touch the crow, you own 22 other tribes because there's a crow. Tro- tro- so strategically, the crow are where you want to be. Yeah. That's where God sent us. You know, so you can't just go without being sent. But the, so you can see how He could put a move of God together for you as a ministry. How you could expand this mm-hmm. revelation if He so chooses to anoint it. Um, and and. The way it's set up, the the the, the, the powwow occurs in this, this little enclosed area. It's not enclosed, but it's, it's got a like a portico over top of it and some bleachers, and all the way around it are like a fairgrounds, and there's booze all the way around it, and you sell hot dogs, whatever, you know, vendor booze, and they sell all kinds of whatever you can imagine. I said a booth, a couple thousand bucks, is how we, we reach all the crow right there, and the 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 head of the tribe reserved us the best booth for next year so we're going back in august but who knows but anyway so there's a native american presence and there's a reason why we do that ministry because there's a call to do that ministry uh to christians in this country it's a specific call but that's another thing so all right we're 35 minutes into nothing and we need to start but i did sort of want to give you guys a bit of an idea that it's not just a bible study you know what i'm saying there's a lot more than meets the eye here. This is very much about authority. If you don't, under, if you, everything in the kingdom of heaven on earth runs under authority. It runs under authority, and so you've got to understand how authority functions, where it comes from, and when you're under it, and when you can use it. You've got to understand that because because you have you have the authority to use the power. You can't use the power if you're not under authority. And so you're going to find that we're always, always, always coming back because authority is a really big deal. If you're under authority, then Satan can say whatever he wants. He can bluff whatever summons in the mail he needs. He can have your landlord come sideways and say, you're out of here. That just means he's got a penthouse over here for you. (laughs) Because God will move you. I didn't miss a Sunday preaching. I got fired on a Wednesday. And I actually thought, wow, cool, I'm not a pastor of a church right now. This has got its advantages. I get my weekends back. <laughs> and I came to the Wednesday night meeting here. I had to tell like 25 people that I got fired and the church is closed. And they're like, no, 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 you're still our pastor. <laughs> and I preached that Sunday. I'm like, oh, man, home church. Okay. Um, all right. Part one, the foundation, the ministry. So you've got, you've got a little bit of, of testimony as to kind of how we roll. Um, restoring biblical ministry, okay, there's a lot of theories as to how we're going to take the country back. A lot of people got a lot of theories on that. The Seven Mountains are, are, are very popular at this time of, right now. But the reality is the only ordained path to change culture is ministry. That's the only biblical solution that you can find. And it's the only example that you can find. And if you went to Ezekiel 34, I'll show you just one sentence to kind of kind of illustrate this. I, I can prove this out on another date, but but this is it's coming from a con. I, I went to the practical school of government, so I, I get wh- where we are in this country, and I understand the nature of this country. Um, Ezekiel 34:6. After he gets done 
In Ezekiel 34, 4, he says, The disease you have not strengthened, neither have you healed that which was sick, neither have you bound up that which was broken, neither have you brought again that which was driven away, neither have you sought that which was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruined them. And they were scattered because there was no shepherd. We're the shepherd. He's screaming at the, at the priesthood right now, but we're the priesthood. So this is written for us. So the disease you have not strengthened, well, that sounds kind of a little bit of a tough deal. How am I supposed to cure people from cancer? D diseased is the verb shalah, and it means to feel weak, become weak, sick, or tired. So this is talking about people that are everyday people. I'm run down. The devil's been oppressing me. I got bad news on Friday. I just got a pink slip. I don't know how I'm going to pay my mortgage. My car just broke down, and the mechanic said 500 bucks, and I got 300 bucks. How am I going to fix my car? How am I going to get from point A to point B? My mother called and just was treating me terrible. Someone I love treated me. Who knows? Weak, sick, or tired. So he's not saying diseased is one thing, but it's not quite all that. You have not strengthened, and when you find out what, what strengthened means, strengthened means encourage. It's another verb, and it means restore to strength, encourage, sustain, or strengthen. Diseased means stre is stressed or anxious. So he's saying, hey, listen, man, there's people every day in your life, and you're not encouraging anyone. The first thing you're going to find out about ministry is it's nothing more than encouragement. And the power that's in it is so immense if you understand that you're at what, what, what the ministry constitutes. Neither have you healed that which was sick. Healed is another verb, rapha. Uh, heal of personal distress. Heal of the broken heart. That which was sick. Sick and diseased are the exact same thing. Feel, feel weak, become weak, become sick or grieved, distressed or anxious. So this whole first part of this is uh, talking about things that you're going to face every day. He does go down and say, and the ones that were shattered to pieces. All right, So they got a really crummy cancer diagnosis and they got two months to live. You didn't at least introduce me to those people and let me try to heal them. At no point in this did you help me. When it was an easy thing, you didn't try to help me. And when it was arguably an incredibly hard thing, you still didn't try to help me. And as a result of that, my sheep are now scattered because they don't know who to trust. They don't know who God is. They don't know what a Christian really is. They look at a pastor, but they don't necessarily trust the pastor. Because they just know spiritually that man, some of it's good, but some of it's not there. And how many pastors actually make themselves available? And how many churches actually minister to the parishioners so that, the, so that out of that ministry, what they've received, they will minister when they go out into the public? And then it goes on to say, so, verse 5, And they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became meat to all the beasts of the field. So they're, so they're under the oppression of Satan when they were scattered. Verse 6, my sheep wandered through all the mountains. Remember the seven mountains, mm -hmm. right? We've got the mountain, of, the, the mountain of family, the mountain of church, the mountain of business, the mountain of entertainment, the mountain of media, mm -hmm. government, and education. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. People are talking about what we need to do is raise someone up who knows what's going on and stick them in the mountain. And God says, everybody's in the mountain. All my sheep are already there. We've got people that are born again Christians sitting in every mountain and every sphere of influence. They just don't have a clue because they never had a pastor. They never had a shepherd that was a real pastor, a real shepherd. And they never ran into a real Christian minister where they could talk to somebody. And then all of a sudden, whoa, wait a minute. That works. That works. That works. I can trust you. I can trust you. I can trust you. Baptized in the Holy Spirit. Converted. All of a sudden they change their behavior and their sphere of influence. Right? It, it, it's much more likely that God will send you into a mountain as a minister so that you can minister to the people that are already in power than to put you in power in a mountain. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yeah, my sheep was scattered upon all the face of the earth, yet none did search after them and none did seek after them. Nobody seemed to terribly care that they're there. And the reality is people care. Everybody cares. Everybody's heart is as big as Texas. It's just how can I be effective and how can I do it? How can I actually minister to people? How can I say in the name of Jesus and get consistent results? And if the results don't happen... Get, have a revelation of what's holding it back. 
And where does the path of ministry need to continue to remove the obstacle? Um, so if the path to change in the nature of this country and the path to change in the nature of our, our, our community and change in the nature of our families is biblical ministry, then I guess we better understand what the heck biblical ministry really is. And there's two components of biblical ministry. One is God's job and one is your job. And there's no anointing for you to do God's job ever, really. You don't, actually don't have any jurisdictional authority to do God's job. And what most people, do, what most people don't understand the difference between the two in ministry. And so not only do we have to understand what this concept of biblical ministry is, we've really got to understand what's my role in it. And you're going to find that your role is very limited. And God's role is very big. Because there's one very fundamental truth here. There's only one person in the room that can reveal God. And it ain't you. It's God. It is God. God. By nature, God is the only one who can reveal God. There's, there's quite a few scriptures we could use to prove it. Um, and you're going to find that the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit reveals God. You're going to find that Jesus reveals God. You're going to find that God the Father reveals God. But the reality is nobody else on earth can reveal God. And so whatever ministry you're doing is fully dependent on God. <laughs> right? And so then if he's ordained a, a, a pattern of ministry for me, and I've got a responsibility in it. If I understand what the pattern of ministry is and I understand my responsibility, then I have a certain expectation that God will do what God says. And this is how you go into ministry with a positive expectation that you know the, de the devil's on his heels. You just know. You just know that you 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 know. Because within you, you know how it works and you know who you are. And, and, and boom, this is how it's going to go down. As opposed to saying, well, I'm supposed to lay hands on the sick and they're supposed to recover. I wonder if it's going to work or not. I believe it's going to work. And then if it doesn't work, I don't know what to do. Because you got to know what to do. What's the reason why it didn't happen? Every single time, one of the strengths of, of, of my nature is, why didn't it work? Why? What's going on? Why didn't it work? It's clearly not God. It's clearly me. I need a revelation. Let's get down, God. Teach me what's going on here. I need to know. Mm -hmm. So, you're going to find that biblical ministry is broken into two components. You have the ministry of the forerunner, and you have the ministry of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You're going to have the ministry of John the Baptist in the Bible. That's who we get to see. And have the understanding that if Jesus Christ needed a forerunner in ministry that you're going to need a forerunner in ministry. Right? If, G if Jesus ordained John the Baptist and John the Baptist's ministry, and he, then it's also a necessary component for Jesus to manifest. Otherwise, there would be no reason for John the Baptist. And Matthew, um, where do I want to go? Matthew 4. Okay, yeah, Matthew 3. I'll prove this point. I'll show, I'll show you something that's kind of cool. Because this ministry of John the Baptist was merged into the ministry of Jesus Christ by Jesus when John the Baptist is imprisoned. And, and there's biblical proof and biblical evidence of this. So in, in Matthew 3, 1, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we have John the Baptist his, cor his cornerstone of the ministry is this verse, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's so much depth to what he's t saying about there. And he's got this supernatural water baptism that he's doing. So he's got really two components. The kingdom of heaven is at hand is his message. And then he's got this, this, this experience of biblical baptism. And there's a lot of teaching on water baptism and what that's all about. Um, that's quite a bit richer and deeper than what most churches. Most churches are teaching that uh, biblical baptism is nothing more than an outward expression of an inward change that's already taken place. It's 180 degrees opposite of that. It is actually an outward expression of an inward transformation that is taking place at that moment. It is designed by its very nature to cause a revelation in the soul and in the body that Jesus Christ is Lord at a very intimate level. A lot of scriptures that support that. So, it's the spirit of religion. Just esteeming one of the aspects of John the Baptist's ministry where Jesus has designed and ordained a path 
to cause an experience within the soul of an individual. If Jesus Christ manifests his presence, we've all felt that, we know what that's like, that's like, whoa, right? Well, if you're going to minister to somebody, you're dependent on Jesus Christ doing that very thing. And if you understand the ministry of water baptism and you're like, wow, I've got this little trick up my sleeve or this little six shooter at my side. Hey, let me share with you water baptism. I've been baptized twice before. Yeah, well, tell me what you thought it was. Then you teach on water baptism and they're like, whoa, that is altogether different. Now their expectation for Christ to do something for them is, is it exists when they go underwater and when they come out, they have the experience and they're like, this ain't nothing like I've ever seen before, right? Exactly. We, we, we actually tested this as a, we, I mean, so everything we preach, we model and test. Yeah. Wait a minute, it works. Okay, we can keep preaching that, <laughs> right? If it doesn't work, don't preach it. Stop it. You shut up. You're not, or ask questions. Figure it. it has to work. It has to bring a witness. It has to bring fruit. You have to know that this works. Otherwise, stay away from it. You know, so, so, so we did that was, we did that. One of the guys that came out of prison, oh my God, that was a crazy day. That is Simon's house and his family and Holy Spirit bombed. We have this portable baptismal tank that we just drop and fold up, fill up. And the next thing you know, we have, we got a baptism meeting going on and a healing meeting going on. And we're like a portable ministry ready to rock. We could, we got, we're totally mobile from, from sound and we're mobile with water. We're mobile with everything. Um, but a bunch of care students were there, and I preached on water baptism. It was the first time they really heard the whole mechanics behind it, and they were like, oh, I'm getting baptized. I'm doing that. I'm doing that. And what was the experience? It was as build, right? Oh, my God. Yeah, so, so, so you have to understand there's this ministry of the forerunner, and, and it's here. And, and next week we'll probably try to really break down this ministry a little bit deeper and kind of show you what it is, the meat of it. And then you come over here to um, chapter 4 of Matthew, uh, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I would have to take you into Mark and a couple other places, but you're going to find that you can prove that this occurs after John the Baptist is imprisoned. So John the Baptist's ministry, r r roughly six months on earth. Six, after six months of this whirlwind, incredible ministry, where everybody, Judea, everybody from Judah came out and everybody from Jerusalem came, where this water baptism took place, the closest place to the, to the Jordan from J Jerusalem is 82 miles on foot through a desert. You really think the, the first thing that John the Baptist said was, repent, you wicked sinner? You think that would drive you 82 miles in the desert to get dunked in water? I don't think so. No, no. This message that John the Baptist has is altogether different than the way that it's portrayed. You really have to understand what repentance is. You've got to understand what repentance is. And, you, and you've got to get this revelation that repentance is nothing more than a change in the way you think. And the second that that change occurs, that is the beginning of a turning of opinion. Right? I'm talking to you and you're starting to change the way you think. That's repentance. It's not when you get to where you, you're going to end up. Repentance is the moment you start to change the way you think. That's repentance. And I can show you, and I'll, sh I'll show you this before we close, that that is actually designed, that, that means that there's been an obstacle removed out of the way where you have come into greater agreement with who God says He is or who God says you are, or what he has to say about your circumstances, you've lined up, you've started to line your thinking. This isn't that you've said, wow, this is what I'm going to think from now on. You've started to change the way you think. You've started to raise your expectation that there could be hope. This is repentance, and you're going to find that Jesus instantly manifests when that happens to affirm or confirm the direction you're heading in. And if you understand what this is going on in ministry, as I'm ministering to somebody, you know there's repentance. You can have an expectation for Christ to bring a revelation that they need. That's right. And you can do it through an impartation. In the name of Jesus, I need you to, bam, I'm just going to give you God right now. Right? You've changed the way that you thought. Jesus said, I've, this is exactly what I'm going to manifest. Who does Jesus love? Who can love you more, Jesus or me? On my best day, I, I love less than the Creator. His love is deep. It's, it's, it's limitless. 
Right? It's limitless. And so his desire for you to have an experience is far greater than anything I could ever desire. Mine is an action out of obedience. Yeah, there's certain people that you really want. You, there's some, sometimes you really have a strong emotional attachment and you really feel for somebody. But a lot of times ministry is done out of obedience. You don't have a feeling one way or the other. Hey, man, go home and have a donut. I'm going to go home and have a donut. I can really care. My back hurts. My knee hurts. My head hurts. I'm this great evangelist. And I lay hands on everybody else. But for some reason today, the enemy's pushing back. I don't want to go anywhere and minister to anybody. But you go because there's a call to go minister. And you also know that the same enemy who's pushing on you, well, okay, fine. Maybe I'm going to struggle with this today for a day or two, but it's not going to stop me from jacking you up someplace else. Right? Better. Right? We're in a war. This is a war. This is a war, and you're on the front lines. Everybody's on the front lines. It's just a degree. Are you operating in authority on the front lines, or are you not operating in authority on the front lines? So we've got this ministry of, of John the Baptist as a forerunner. Christ says, we can affirm that we, 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 can, we can make the conclusion that, or draw the conclusion that if Christ needed it, we need it. So we need to understand what this ministry is. Isaiah 40, um, th- verse 3, I'll read just two verses here on this to kind of give you just a real brief overview. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll delve into quite a few verses that'll tie. See, the beautiful thing about biblical ministry is when there, when there is a p- pattern that God is going to establish on the earth, he reveals it in the Old Testament many times. So it's revealed in the Old Testament, then it's re-revealed or introduced in the New Testament. So you've got this beautiful language of Hebrew that is spoken in, which is this incredible language of pictures and characters. Each character is a picture, and so he a very expressive language for God to paint a picture of what his true feelings are with very few words. Um, and then all of a sudden, he releases the New Testament or, his, or the Word of God in Greek, which is this extraordinarily expressive language that the New Testament is written in. It's not out of pictures, but it has so many different words that can be used in so many different contexts that it's really rich. There's this love, there's this love, there's this love, there's this love. Well, in English, there's just love. Right? And so what you'll find we do a lot of times is we go back into the language that it was spoken in not because we're Hebrew scholars, we're far from it, but concordances are pretty good at, at giving you information that the Holy Spirit can then bear witness to and say, this is right, all right, we believe this to be true. And then you can take that revelation into the field and minister with it and say, oh, there's fruit. Okay, the Holy Spirit wasn't steering me wrong. He's the spirit of truth, and so we can discern it out. But these things are written, and when you start to pull John the Baptist and what it was spoken about his ministry, and then you see how the Holy Spirit revealed that ministry in two different languages, and you see the similarities and the overlap, you're going to find that this ministry is designed to remove the obstacle, the very obstacle, so that Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is then ordained to fill where that void was with a manifestation of who Christ is, Amen. period. At the point of need of the individual in front of you, which you have a pretty good idea, but God knows precisely what he wants to do and what he wants to do. And you're going to find that all of a sudden, wait a minute, I'm a partner. God's driving the bus. I got one ear towards God. What do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? He's not giving me a word. Therefore, I just do. I ask you questions. We just, what you're going to find that it's a very simple process, not complicated, bears a ton of fruit because Jesus Christ has been given the path to be Jesus. Okay, Isaiah 40, where am I? So that's, that comes after Proverbs, doesn't it? Isaiah 40, okay, Isaiah 41, no, we don't want to be there. So, uh, the voice of him that cries in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God, every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be be revealed with a certain guarantee Jesus Christ is going to reveal himself that's what he's saying the glory of the Lord shall be revealed it's not placing a time limit in 20 minutes and 30 minutes and a week from now 200 years from now no this is a this is what's going to happen some cat's going to cry in the wilderness prepare you the way of the Lord and then all of a sudden Every valley is going to be exalted. Every mountain and hill is going to be made low. Valley to be exalted. Okay, you can picture whatever the valley is being lifted up. What you're going to see is straight level ground. You're not going to have anything to stumble over, anything to trip over. But it also means to bear continuously. In other words, you've got a picture of the cross. Jesus walking, you walking over the shoulders of Christ, over the valley, 
that actually that word means bear continuously. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill be made low. Okay, mountain, hill, mountain is mountain. Hill can very easily mean explicit, illicit form of worship. Whatever you're thinking, that's contrary to who God says he is, who God says you are, and what he says about your circumstance. Whom you serve, that's whom you worship. What you believe dictates whom you serve. What you believe dictates whom you worship. So there's a, there, what, what you're going to find is this is going to pull, it's going to illustrate where there's incorrect or impure worship. Where you worship, that's where the power falls. If you're worshiping the enemy, which you don't even realize you're doing because you're following the principles of him inadvertently, then the power that comes to you is darkness. It's not light. Look at the body of Christ in this country. Is it light or is it dark? They're worshiping in some days, but their worship is going to Satan. It's not going to God. Because Monday through Saturday, they don't serve God. It's okay to maybe not love my neighbor, every neighbor. Someone's under my thumb. Forget him. I don't care. Maybe I hate Obama. Maybe I hate Trump. Maybe I hate Pelosi. Maybe I hate the mailman. I don't know who did me wrong last week, who did me wrong 10 years ago. The command is to love. The command is to love your enemy. It's not optional. You don't get your prayers answered. Mark 11, everybody says, don't doubt in your heart, just believe. Yeah, then read on. And if you have ought against anybody, better say, forgive. In fact, you're going to find that love is such a requirement that if you refuse to love your neighbor, God sends you to the tormentors, which is Matthew 18. It's, it's incredible. It's not saving. It's not, it's not you walking away from God, giving Satan leave to torment you. No, it's God putting you actually on the rack is what it means to be tortured until you submit to say, okay, 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 I will love him. There's, no, there's only death in hatred. There's only life in love. And if the Father loves you, he wants you to learn how to love because that's where the blessing flows and that's where everything is taken care of. That's where supernatural healing is, supernatural provision. That's where all of everything flows out of. So... Sure. can't do that on my own. I need to experience his love for me to heal my heart in order because I, I say I forgive this person with my will. That is forgiveness. Forgiveness, the, king, the kingdom of heaven runs on action. It doesn't run on feeling. The kingdom of the world runs on feeling. The enemy wants you to think that your belief is a feeling, that your love is a feeling. No, no, no. Your belief is an action and your love is an action. That's how God accounts for love. Love is an action. Now, you want your feeling to line up with your action. This, this is important. This is freedom, right? Yeah. But, but you're going to have to say, in the name of Jesus, I don't care. I forgive. It says love your enemy. Well, how is that possible? Yeah. Right? It doesn't say have, um, have them over for dinner. It's not suggesting that by anything. In fact, some people that we're instructed to love are down there toxic and poisonous, and we need to just keep them at arm's length. We don't need to let them into us. But in the name of Jesus Christ, I forgive them. Yeah. Father, okay, you know how I feel for the individual. I don't want to feel that way. I want to feel the way you feel. So in the name of Jesus, I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, you come into my heart and you heal me because you're going to find that the ministry of Jesus Christ, which is now being performed by the Holy Spirit, is the healing of the broken heart. And the broken heart is really where the obstacle is that is stopping Jesus from being Jesus for you at that place. And, and it, this ministry is designed to continually shine a light on those obstacles, however big or small they are, give you the practical action to have them removed, and then they're removed as evidenced by your witness, not mine. The other one goes, oh, wow, that really works. Yeah, and then after a period of time, the feeling lines up with the action, and it's like, hallelujah. And when I think of this person's name, it doesn't cause me any kind of feeling. It doesn't, it doesn't you know, there's no more bondage. I'm not enslaved by this person. When, he, when I think of this memory, it do, no longer enslaves me. I'm free from it. But the reality is, it's not me doing some hocus pocus. It's the Holy Spirit. You're going to find that all of this is the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's all the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's right.
it's the Holy Spirit creating the desire. It's the Holy Spirit doing the work. It really isn't you at all. Because it's Jesus Christ in you, the hope of glory, the expectation that it's going to be done. We'll, we'll get into the Holy Spirit at great, at great detail. Um, we don't have time today. We're already at 102. But um, I will show you the, the, the freedom that is the Holy Spirit. And he's such a gentleman that he's, he doesn't uh, force himself through you often so you're just not aware of him doing through you. You're not quite aware. But if you start to get a revelation, a fullness of the ministry of the Holy Spirit and how to cooperate with that ministry, then it changes. It's a, it, it can be a total, total game changer. But forgiveness is an action first, followed by the feeling second. In the name of Jesus Christ, I forgive so-and-so. That's a transfer of authority on the spot. So you struggle to minister. All right, so it's your mother that causes the issue. All right, whatever, fine. Let's find out what she did if we have time. But the most important thing here is in the name of Jesus Christ, can you forgive her? Can you let her off the hook? Oh, it's hard, right? It's hard. It's hard. You see people shaking over these things. And you're like, listen, this is what's keeping you in bondage. Do you feel good right now or do you want to feel free? No, I don't want this to feel this way. Okay, then in the name of Jesus Christ, you got to say you forgive them. you got to tell the Holy Spirit that you want to be released from this thing. And in the name of Jesus Christ, you're going to bless them. Something along those lines. As soon as they do that, there's an authority that has changed. The, the devil no longer has authority in that picture. And immediately in the name of Jesus, whatever the heck this thing is, is out. And the healing takes place. It's just that fast. And so you use the actions in the name of Jesus Christ to be to, to create authority so that you can operate under that authority and and Yeah, so the heart healing is a uh Oh, so no, no, heart healing is a lifelong journey. Sorry. If I led you to believe that you could get healed, your heart healed in in 5 seconds, that's a lie. No. Um, it, it's the, the healing. Jesus Christ is a heart surgeon. Yeah. And there's wounds that go back. Maybe in the womb is when some of these things started. It's, it's a long time ago. And we don't really understand the nature of them. Uh, but the Holy Spirit does know. And the Holy Spirit knows which one he wants to work on first. And he's going to be very strategic with the removal because he's going to build a foundation within you that you can launch off of and not fall. No, the healing of the broken heart. Okay, I'm 10 years into that. Much farther down the road. To me, there's a daily maintenance of the heart, and there's the healing of it. And your heart is needing healing today. A month from now, someone you love may cause it to be need more healing. The, the nature of the world is to, to break our heart. Okay, hope deferred. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. You're commanded to have an expectation. You're commanded to raise your expectations and take the limit off of God. And when it doesn't happen, Scripture says, the Word of God says, yep, it's going to break your heart when it doesn't happen the way you want, but I still need you to do it. And so the very walk by itself, even if through obedience, can cause heartache. You know. And Jesus has this ministry of healing the broken heart. Let's... Uh, let's um, let, let, let's let's go, go, go to Luke 4.18 and, and then let's just kind of wind things up. Um, and and I'll just, I, I touched briefly on John the Baptist. I'm just going to introduce one scripture. Jesus Christ, his ministry. So the ministry of the forerunner is, is one of removing obstacles. Um, 4.18, the spirit of the Lord, is, this is Jesus Christ announcing his ministry. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because, because can be translated for this cause. That's what because means. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me for this cause he has anointed me. So he's declaring that the Holy Spirit is upon him. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Um, for this cause I have an anointing to preach the gospel to the poor. So he has an anointing to preach the gospel and so do you to the poor. The poor means somebody who's unable to do it on their own. That's each and every person in this room. Mm -hmm. All of us can't do it on our own. 
we're never supposed to shoulder the burden alone. We're supposed to be encouragers. We're part of a body. We are part of a body. First Corinthians 12, we're part of a body. We are one body. If one part of the body suffers, every part of the body suffers. That's what the word says. That means someone over in India right now who's suffering is causing suffering in my body. My bank account could be full. This could be that. That could be that. But the reality is there's something missing. Right? There's something. God says if one part suffers, they all suffer. If one part's honored, they're all honored. And so, yeah, if we keep ministering one at a time, you're going to find that these, that, but I thought we're not going to go there. So, he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, people that are, and he has sent me to heal what? The broken heart, not the, not cancer. He hasn't sent me to heal cancer. He hasn't sent me to heal any of these things. He sent me to heal the broken heart. To preach deliverance to the captives, to recovering sight to the blind. Set at liberty them that are bruised. Captives in liberty are the exact same thing. No, no, no. Preach deliverance to the captives. Recovering sight to the blind. Deliverance to the cap. Deliverance and liberty are the are this exact same words in the in the in the Greek. This isn't talking about delivering you from Satan. This is talking about taking something that's out of you. The broken. This is all about the broken heart and recovering sight to the blind. You've been thinking about something. You've been thinking about God, who God says He is, who God says you are, and what He says about your circumstances in a different light. And recovering sight to the blind is you're going to start to see it through my eyes, and you're going to have to start to have a spiritual understanding. You're going to start to have this revelation that the kingdom of heaven is at hand means it's a spiritual kingdom, and there's all kinds of spiritual laws, there's all kinds of new spiritual truths, and there's all kinds of new practical application that need to take place. And you're going to be you, you've been raised in one world looking at it one way, and now Jesus is going to come along. He's going to heal your heart, which is going to enable you to see it His way. That's all that it's talking about. And and so we're to, and we're talking about people that have been held captive by this philosophy. Captive means they don't have any authority, right? They're under they're under the authority of the enemy. They're under the oppression of the enemy. All of a sudden they're restored in authority, and now all of a sudden they can see clearly. So you can see that Jesus isn't really called here to heal anything but the broken heart. But of course you, we have this extravagant healing ministry of Jesus, so we know that He uses physical healing to heal the broken heart. And you also know that he doesn't want people sick, right? Mm -hmm. Heal them, heal them, heal them. I paid for illness, so heal it. But but you're going to find that we're going to talk a lot about over probably these next two weeks, we're going to talk a lot about the Holy Spirit. We're, we're going to delve into John the Baptist. We're going to delve into Jesus' ministry, what this looks like practically for you. And hopefully that brings a, a, a little greater revelation on, uh, okay, wait a minute, demystifies is maybe a better way of saying it. Okay, this is not actually... This is actually a process that I can wrap my heart around and I can start to understand. This is what John the Baptist did. These are what the obstacles are. I can do that. And then, and then, and then we can model some of that um, in Jesus' name. We good to stop? We're good to stop.